Well, it, uh, we're going to now we're going to talk about uh, when now, and uh, you know you. We have uh, the last uh, few years, uh, you keep hearing, we have the largest wind farm in the world. Uh, NRG just bought, Yield just bought uh, Terrigens, I think most of their portfolio. And uh, Johnny uh, Kasana comes from, not, not Johnny Clark, right? Um, Johnny Kasana comes from Portland, which is, as you may know, that's where young people go to retire. <laughs> if you ever watch Portlandia. Um, and he told me this other bit of information. I did not find this online, but he, he admitted that he was in a 20-piece punk rock ukulele band. I don't know where to begin on that. Um, and he studied anthropology, so maybe that's part of that. Um, so if you stay around to the uh, 7 o'clock tonight, he'll be playing at the uh, Trouts. Um, okay, well, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Johnny uh, with EDP. So we have some young people in the back there. Uh, if you don't learn anything else today, your past follows you. Be careful. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so good morning. Uh, it's been great presentations. Uh, I'll, I'll echo Jefferson. Uh, such an honor to be here. Uh, Kern EDC does great work. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, wind energy uh, here in Kern County in California, uh, United States at large. Uh, Dan was so fantastic with his uh, technology policy finance nexus and uh, Mark brought up some very interesting ideas about uh, the future of grid management and how important it's going to be to uh, reimagine uh, our grid going forward if we're serious about carbon in the electric sector. And those are things I'm going to touch on also to the degree they're reiterated. Uh, you can take that they're important. Uh, you can take that as the relevance. That's what happens when you go late in the day, I suppose. So <clears throat> I represent EDP Renewables. We're one of the largest wind energy companies in the world. Uh, we're, we're transnational. Our North American platform uh, has over four uh, gigawatts of capacity installed. Uh, globally, we have 8.6 gigawatts installed. And we have 1,200 megawatts in the US uh, under construction or under contract uh, by 2016 to be constructed. So you know, we're making hay. Uh, things are good right now. Uh, here in Kern County, uh, we are actually building 200 megawatts as we speak. There's boots on the ground and cranes in the air and uh, turbines are being erected, blades are being flown. Uh, we're currently employing 250 uh, construction workers. Uh, long term, there'll be about 30 full-time positions for decades to come. It's uh, $450 million of private investment. And uh, it represents uh, eight years of development. It's uh, actually a project that in an earlier life, uh, when I was a developer, I cut my teeth uh, here in Kern County. Uh, so uh, working on this project, we're excited to be the most recent addition to a very eclectic collection of turbines uh, dating back several decades here in Kern County. Um, can, I just, can I just talk about Kern County for a minute? I love Kern County. <laughs> As a wind developer, I, I mean, I love Kern County for a lot of reasons, but it's a great place to be in the wind industry, uh, perhaps the best in the world. We have an unparalleled wind resource in the Tehachapi Pass. Uh, it's unlike nothing else. Uh, it has to do with the oceans and the desert and the mountains and this consistent stream every day of very high caliber wind. It's one of the first places that wind was ever installed at the utility scale several decades ago, back when it was a risky, you know, fringe technology. And we're still building wind today. As I mentioned, my company is doing it right now, you know, down the road. And uh, I think that speaks to uh, the real story of wind. Uh, it's really transcended from this uh, very fringe, very alternative type of technology to a very mainstream technology uh, in terms of cost competitiveness and in terms of reliability. And that is something, if you haven't had the chance to drive through the Tehachapi Pass, I encourage you to take a detour and go look at it. It's an amazing uh, testament to that tale of how far we've come. So I could spend the whole segment on accolades, you know, the planning and development department is unparalleled, and uh, we love working here. Anyway. <laughs> so we can move on a little bit. Uh, I'll talk some about California. 
uh, at large. Uh, California is second in the nation in terms of installed capacity for wind, the 6,000 megawatts. Represents $12 billion of private investment, over 4,000 jobs, um, you know, uh, over 6% of annual energy need. Uh, also, this is something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot in terms of energy, but uh, wind is a very low water consumer. Uh, and not very many sources of energy are, especially thermal generation. Uh, so what we're talking about is 2.8 billion gallons of water saved per year uh, because of the wind that's on the system. Um, 7.4 million metric tons of carbon reduction, the, the equivalent of 1.3 million cars off the road. Um, all of these uh, great features uh, of wind, I think that California is uh, a testament uh, to the success uh, of this industry, and Kern County is right at the heart of that. It's the tip of the spear. Uh, here's a map uh, at large. Again, you see that uh, oddly absent in the in the lower lower part of the country. But uh, generally, uh, throughout the country, there's a, there's a lot of installed capacity. California is is number two, followed by Texas, which has about double what we have here. So that's a gauntlet. I don't know if we care <laughs> about being number two to Texas, but there it is. Uh, I know they don't mind being number one. Um, also, another thing that uh, doesn't get brought up a whole lot, but is a really Im important aspect of the economic uh, development parts of wind is that there's a lot of manufacturing, over 550 manufacturing facilities for wind energy technology uh, domestically in the US, 19 of those are in California. And uh, we've seen a huge boom in that kind of uh, build out, which, ha which plays a big role in the declining cost, uh, some of what, what Dan talked about and what I'll talk about later. Um, here is a, a, a chart of aggregate uh, installation uh, over, the, over the past 15 years or so. And what you see is, you know, there are some peaks and valleys, and that is related somewhat to federal uh, tax protection or lack thereof. Um, but you see a steep incline in installed capacity. And the more we build as an industry, the better we get at it, uh, the lower the costs are, the more competitive it becomes. Uh, and that's, that's the good news story that I, that I try to talk about a lot. It, sometimes I speak to folks who learned something that was true about wind energy four or five years ago. And uh, something that I always try and bring up is that's antiquated history at this point. Um, the technology has advanced so dramatically um, that it's highly cost competitive. Reliability questions that were, that were very prevalent 15 years ago about what happens with intermittent resources. At the level of penetration we have, uh, they're completely solved. It's just not an issue anymore. Um, at the levels that some people talk about or would like to envision, uh, it does become something we have to pay more attention to, but uh, reliability of intermittent resources is not an issue. Uh, for the level of penetration that we have today, and uh, the success of programs like the California RPS and like the federal PTC uh, have dramatically reduced costs to the point where wind is extremely com cost competitive. Uh, another big part of that cost competitiveness is the technology. Um, if I can use this, can I do this? This point? Okay, no one's used the pointer really. Um, but what we have here is, is just a, a, t a time scale. Uh, so you can see the size of turbines and how much larger they've become uh, in the past few decades. Um, and the turbines that we're installing now, they're 3.3 megawatts. Uh, and for instance, uh, in real life experience, in Rising Tree Wind Farm down the road, we're installing 3.3 megawatt turbines, they're 500 feet tall. And right next door, there's a wind farm from the 1980s with 100 kilowatt machines. And in about the same land footprint, they've got 240 of those machines, which we could replace with seven of ours in the same footprint. And there's room for more than seven. You know. uh, and that is an incredible increase in the bang for the buck. And it's not just that you're getting a larger rotor swept diameter and you're getting more energy out of uh, each spin of the blades, uh, but the gears are much better because uh, we've had more time to figure it out. And, uh, the other thing is that we have much better software than we had 20 years ago. Um, when we look at the future of this technology, we see these turbines getting larger. Uh, one of the main constraints on this kind of uh, size technology is actually the length of a flatbed truck, getting these blades to the site. If it's a Boeing aircraft, you can build it and then fly it where you need to go. Um, but a turbine blade, 
the turbine blades at this scale uh, have mostly maxed out uh, the transportation constraint. And so what we hear in prototypes and from the manufacturers is actually uh, blades that can be constructed on site. Um, things that are sort of lattice towers, la lattice blades that are wrapped in uh, uh, fabric like you would find on the roof of a, of a circus tent, you know, or, or piecemeal that can be uh, assembled on site but still uh, produce effective energy. And when we overcome those kind of hurdles, we'll see the cost decline even more and the uh, efficiency of each individual tower increase even more. So. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an assessment from uh, Lazard, which is uh, independent, um, a, an independent economic firm that looks at renewable technologies. And uh, this is, a, again, this is a very steep curve. This is just the past five years. And there's a 58% uh, decrease in the levelized cost of energy. Um, if you looked at that uh, chart going back to the 1980s, it would be more like a 90% decrease. Uh, so this is the sort of uh, you know, good news story transcended into mainstream in terms of economic competitiveness uh, that is true now that is really just a few years old. Um, this is also from Lazard. It's, uh, it, what, you, what you have here is a, a bunch of different types of generation, and these are non-subsidized prices, and those bars represent uh, the, the range of wind that's publicly reported. Not every, um, not every uh, power purchase agreement price is publicly reported, but uh, what you see there is it going toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with natural gas. Um, if there were some sort of tax protection extended or you know, this sort of MLP uh, that Dan was talking about uh, or, or any sort of comprehensive tax reform um, that removed entrenched uh, subsidies and put energy, new technologies against old technologies in a, in a sort of fair level playing field. Um, it's our perspective that wind would continue to go toe to toe and would, and would be a really uh, significant player in any even open source market. And that is new. That's not something we could say 10 years ago. Um, here also, I don't know if you can see it so well over here. Oh, but this is a this is a projection of uh, this is from the Department of Energy. Uh, this this here is the sort of range of DOE projected gas prices going forward over the next few decades. And these lines here are uh, power purchase agreements that have already been signed and executed. And it shows the long term hedge that wind energy can provide against fluctuation in, in gas prices. Uh, because if a fuel commodity cost is your primary driver uh, for the cost of your energy, um, we can tell you 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, what it will cost to run a turbine. It will still cost zero dollars in fuel. You know, and, and that's something that um, there are challenges uh, to intermittent resources uh, at large penetrations, but those kind of cost factors uh, are real advantages that other forms of conventional uh, generation don't offer. And we see it as part of a, a portfolio solution. Um, in terms of what, what happens going forward, uh, from a national perspective, a lot of different experts uh, you know, can't seem to agree on whether um, the production tax credit that's been such an essential part of this industry's success uh, will be extended. Uh, it may, it may not. Uh, regardless of whether it is, there's some uh, existing uh, retroactive policies that uh, will enable some degree of certainty for the next couple of years, but after that, um, it's really up in the air. You know, things like what just happened in China this morning may have a, uh, an impact on that. Um, th things like we hear out of Sacramento, uh, some sort of uh, idea for a California clean, clean energy or, or carbon reduction standard. Uh, if that includes or engages uh, utility scale electric sector, um, then wind has a big part to play. It may not, and that's uh, one of the conversations that we'll see play out over the next year or so. Um, but if it does, if any one of those things um, has an impact on creating new demand in California, Kern is extremely well positioned because again, like I said at the beginning, it, we have a tremendous resource here, um, and it's one of the best places, bases to be. Um, we talked a little bit uh, earlier today in some of the other presentations about uh, the mandates and the executive orders that are currently on the books. Um, and in terms of 
what do we do beyond that? Uh, there is this 2050 target for carbon reductions uh, across sector statewide to get to 80 percent below 1990 levels of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the existing cap and trade that we have and the 33 uh, percent renewable mandate by 2020 doesn't get us there. It doesn't get us close to there. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do in transportation. There's a lot of things we can do in the building sector. Uh, but there are uh, a few groups that have been trying to look at the electric sector and see the ways in which it can be the gateway uh, to that kind of carbon reduction. Uh, one of them that, that I really like is the California 2030 Low Carbon Grid Study, um, which d looks at some of the things uh, so very pretty analogous to what Mark was talking about this morning in terms of uh, what are not just what are ways in which we can get beyond an idea of just topping off the electric system with clean energy because it looks nice or it looks pretty, but what are the ways in which we could actually ask zero carbon resources, including energy efficiency, including energy storage, including demand response, including uh, zero carbon um, generation, as a collective portfolio, how can we ask those kind of resources to perform the grid system work in a way that's collaborative uh, with the highly efficient natural gas that we've heard about as well uh, to, really, to really think about reducing carbon in a cost-effective way, in a reliable way that looks different than how we've always done it. Um, and some of the results from, from that study are, are sort of being touted around. It's, it's midway through, but uh, the preliminary results are pretty encouraging. They talk about 40 million metric tons of of carbon uh, removed from the grid at marginal cost, which is about 22 percent um, of, of where we need to be in 2030 if we want to get uh, to those 2050 targets. Uh, that includes enabling 4.25 million electric vehicles on the road, you know, LEAFs hopefully, um, as well as the California high-speed rail. Uh, and it also includes $58 billion of new investment. Um, and it's, it's some transmission, but not it's not all transmission, it's some generation, it's not all generation, it's not any silver bullet, it's a portfolio approach. Um, and the amazing thing that the preliminary results of this study found are that that $58 billion of new investment in the next 15 years is effectively paid for over 15 years through cost savings. Um, and that, that pans out at relatively conservative ideas about uh, a, a carbon price of about $31 and a fuel price of about 6 which is sort of in the middle of what uh, folks who do those kind of projections project. <clears throat> um, so, you know, if that happens, Kern's in a great position. Um, if not, you know, we'll still be here uh, employing those 30 individuals at our uh, wind farm. We hope to do more. Thank you so much. Well, good luck at Trout's tonight. Sorry, I can't make it. I have to walk my dog. Um, sounds like you're not retired in, in uh, Portland. Um, 